Hello. Uh, hello, everybody. Well, as, uh, my name is Jesus. I'm a software engineer at Matamos, and I'm going to talk about the Go compiler. Uh, well, I'm, I'm from Spain, and I, I come here by plane. Uh, an Airbus 320, you know, a big cylinder of metal, more than 40 tons of metal that they throw uh, from one country to another. So, uh, let's be clear. I don't, I, I think there's no reason, no reason to that thing to fly. You know, we can talk about aerodynamics, we can talk about airflow, uh, we can talk about suspension, but I don't buy it. It's magic for me, okay? And the thing is, anything, any advance enough technology is completely indistinguish indistinguishable from magic. But, well, the magic word, I'm here, and we are going to talk about the magic of the Go compiler. So, let's start. Okay. Um, first of all, a disclaimer. I'm not a, co a programmer of the Go compiler. All that we are going to see here is from my learnings, reading the Go compiler code. Uh, as I said, I work for Maremos. Maremos is a, a, a communication platform similar to Slack. Uh, so I basically write APIs and JavaScript code. So what you are going to see here is based on my learnings from reading the Go compiler code. Well, um, this nice guy here is our example. It's my gopher is going to represent this hello world that is going to be with us during the whole talk. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the Go compiler 1.20. Uh, I didn't make it for the 1.21 uh, because there's some changes. I'm going to talk about them uh, briefly, but there are some changes in how a certain part of the transformation inside the compiler is done, so I wasn't able to uh, update that on time for the talk. But well, uh, it's going to, I'm going to talk about the 1.20 version. Well, this is how normally a compiler works, okay? Everybody knows that you have your Go code, you put that in somewhere, and there's this magician, that's the Go compiler, and suddenly you have a super fast binary executable code mm, that you can, well, that is, can be even cross-compiled to, to other architectures, super amazing, so that is magic, right? Uh, but what happened inside the hat? How this little nice guy here gets converted in that, super fast uh, executable binary. Well, we are going to go through all these phases of the compiler. This is a map that you are going to see over and over again, so don't pay too much attention now. So we are going to go through all these steps during, during the talk. And so don't, don't pay much attention now. Okay, let's start from the beginning. You have, whenever you have the source code, you, the first thing that happens is the lexer or the scanner, how it's called in the Go compiler code. And what the lexer does is convert our source code in tokens. A token is kind of a word inside the language, something like a keyword is a token, um, an identifier is a token, a, a symbol like open parenthesis is a token. So it basically convert our text in a list of tokens. It reads one character at a time. So it takes our source code and start reading one character, then another character, then another character, and whenever it finds a token, returns the token. And it generates the tokens on demand. So something else is asking for tokens, and the, parse, the lexer is going to um, start reading characters until find a token, return the token, and wait. And whenever uh, something else call again to get another token, keeps going. But let's see an example of that. This is our hello world. So our scanner start reading the text here. It's going to go character by character. So it's going to read P-A-C-K-A-G-E. And then it's going to find a space. What's going to happen here is suddenly say, okay, I see something there that is a token, can be, looks like an identifier, but 
do I have a keyword in the language that is called package? And the answer is yes. So in this case, it's going to return the package token. Okay, so it keeps going character by character. I'm going to speed up a bit the process, but it's character by character always. So it reads main uh, and new line, and it's going to say, okay, main looks like an identifier. Um, do I have a keyword that is called main? The answer is no. So main is a identifier token with a main value. And something that is super cool is everybody knows that Go have optional uh, semicolons at the end of the uh, statements. But from the lecture perspective, it's optional because it's going to add them automatically. So based on the token that you are handling and if the next character is a new line and certain rules, is going to decide to insert automatically a semicolon. So from the rest, from the perspective of the rest of the compiler, semicolons are not optional at all. Semicolons are mandatory for the rest of the compiler. So um, if we keep going, we see import that looks like an identifier, but it's a keyword, FMT that is an string, a semicolon again, automatically added. Funk is a keyword, main is identifier, open parentheses, close parentheses, open brackets, open braces, is, um, they are all tokens, independent tokens. Then FMT, that is a identifier, dot, uh, print a len, that's another identifier, open braces, a string, close, uh, open parentheses, a string, close parentheses, uh, automatically added semicolon, close braces, automatically added semicolon. And that is exactly the same code, but it's a, with a different representation. But it's exactly the same. You can rebuild the code in the left, having only that. Okay, oh, well, there's a, a note that probably you are not going to see well if you are at the back of the room, at the bottom right corner. Doesn't matter because that notes are not for the talk, are for the people that wants to uh, use the slides or use or use the recording to explore more. So this code, he, this note here is saying that this is generated with the Go scanner library, and you are going to see also, for example, file names and, and line numbers for the Go compiler because we are going to see a source code of the Go compiler. So actually, it's the next thing that we are going to see here. These are how the scanner work under the hood. Uh, as, you, as I said, at the bottom right corner, you have uh, the file name in the Go compiler with the line number of these three blocks here. Basically, um, the lecture is, is going to be a huge switch case as a statement that is going to, uh, based on the character that is reading, is going to generate tokens. Let's start with a very simple example that is the, the semicolon. Whenever it finds a semicolon, it's going to consume that character and it's going to um, return a semicolon in this case, a semicolon token or set that the current token is a semicolon token. Okay, another a bit more complex example is the asterisk. Whenever you see an asterisk, it's going to consume that asterisk and say, okay, there's a multiplication operation here. And, but if the next character is unequal, it's uh, an assignation token, an assignation operation token that have an operation multiplication operation. Uh, and if there's not equal after that, it's going to be a star token that is a multiplication token. And another example is the dot. Whenever you have a dot, you consume that dot. You, can, you check if, the, if, it, if it is a decimal, and if it's a decimal, uh, that if the next character is a decimal, and if it's a decimal, you are going to delegate all the lecture, uh, all the, uh, to the part of the lecture that take care of the numbers there and return the token that it takes or it finds. And then uh, if it's not a decimal, the next thing can be a dot. If it's a dot, it's going to consume that dot. And if the next character is also a dot, we are talking about a dot, dot, dot or, al or an ellipsis. And we return that token. And if that's not the case, I'm going to rewind everything consume the token dot and return a dot. So this is, is kind of very straightforward approach of doing all this is I find a character, I 
check out the next one, things like that. So it's very simple code. If you check um, the source code there, it's, it's easy to read. Okay, once you have the, um, all the tokens, you can go to the parser. The, the parser is going to read one token at a time and it's going to generate an uh, abstract syntax tree, a tree structure that represents our source code. We have um, one abstract syntax tree per file, and we use the file node, the file, yeah, the file abstract syntax tree, the file AST node is there going to be the root node. Also, it's interesting that when I, when I was saying that the parser is, um, the parser is, um, uh, getting, it's, the, sorry, the lexer is working on demand, somebody was asking tokens, the one that was asking tokens is the parser. The parser is start asking tokens one by one. Um, also, something interesting about the parser is the parser uh, generates AST, and they is, that AST only can have three things uh, in the root of the file. That is um, the package definition, the imports and the declarations. If there's something else, that's not Go. So that's not possible to represent that in, in, in Go. Well, you can have comments and pragmas, but the reality is uh, what is represented in the AST for that is, is um, the package, the imports, and the, um, and the declarations. And the declarations only can be type declarations, constants, variables, and functions. And that's it, that's the language. Um, okay, let's see an example of that. This is uh, our hello world, and the, the code in the right is a, a AST, an abstract syntax tree, a tree representation of our source code. It's basically the same information represented in a different way, okay? Uh, that is generated with a Go AST package that is not exactly the AST implementation that is used in the compiler, but for visualization it's great. And actually, if you, are go if you want to play with AST, that you can do a lot of stuff with, AST, with AST, it's a great library. So, um, uh, let's see. For example, we have here the package main, and you see that in the, in the node name of the AST file. You see here the import FMT that have that information there and also some uh, information at the end. The function main declaration is there and the uh, body of the function is there. So there is a, a, a clear correlation between the, the source code and our AST. Okay, let's see how it works uh, in kind of in real time. So it start reading, well, the first thing before even start reading any token is going to create the AST file node. So once we have the AST file, we are going to start populating that. It's going to read the first token that says package. Okay, I can't do anything yet. So the next token is main and okay, I know that this is the package main, so I'm going to populate that data in the AST file. Then it's going to read import. Ah, okay, I'm going to start importing things, so I'm going to start populating this structure here. And okay, I have this FMT import, so I'm going to add that there and keep and so on. So there's keeps do, keep doing things like that. Okay, let's see how it how it is in the source code. Is um, one thing about the source code of the uh, of the parser is uh, this uh, block here at the top that is going to define. The, um, the grammar that is going to be supported. In this case, we have the import spec that can be a point or a package name that is optional, and then the import path, and the import path is a string literal, so easy peasy. Okay, whenever we see an import token, it's going to call this function here, and it's going to start creating this import declaration, this import declaration node. Then it's going to check for if the next, to ne next token is a name or a dot. If it's a name, it's going to take the name. If it's a dot, it's going to take the dot. Well, then it's going to take the path. This is a, this is a case that is not mandatory, as you can see. Uh, it keeps going, so it's going to take the path. Uh, that is a string literal. It's going to check that check for errors there, and it's going to return that node. So that's how it's creating the import node that you see um, you see here. Okay. 
This is another interesting one. I really love that one because um, it's a, the function declaration, but at the same time, you can see that it's a function declaration, but at the same time, it's the method declaration. The difference between the function declaration and the method declaration is that it has a receiver. That's it. Um, so uh, we see here, every time you see the func uh, keyword, it's going to call this function, and it's going to uh, generate a func declaration. Then it's going to le check for the left parenthesis. Uh, if the left parenthesis exists, it's going to be a method, and it's going to check for the parameter list. And it's going to check if there's zero parameters, then it, there's going to be an error. If more than one parameter is going to be a warning, well, it's going to be an error. And if it's one exact parameter, it's, it's going to work perfectly. Uh, then it's going to check for the name of the function. If there's a name of function, it's going to process that. If not, it's going to fail, but depending on is it a method or a, a function, it's going to give you a different error. And finally, uh, it's going to check for the function body and it's going to delegate the parsing of the function body to another function. And re finally, return the node. Uh, okay, now we have our abstract syntax tree. The next thing that is going to happen is type checking. For type checking, what it's going to do, I'm not going to get too, too deep into the type checking, but the type checking, what it's going to do is it's going to take all the uh, package level objects, all that declaration, function declaration, constant declarations, type declarations, um, all that stuff, and, and it's going to check that package level um, uh, types without including the body of the functions. And in a second pass, is going to check the body of the functions. That is done because you need the context to check the types inside the body of the functions. Um, yeah. Okay. Once you have uh, the type checker, the type checking done, you start generating the intermediate representation. In AST is an intermediate representation, actually, but this is another intermediate representation that is more use, well, is useful for other things in the in the compiler. So, yeah, it, it is here. Um, the AST is one AST per file. The intermediate representation is one intermediate representation per package. Uh, it's generated from the AST. It's going to start reading the AST. It's going to start navigating the AST and generating all the, all the declarations of the, um, of the, in the package. Uh, yeah, and that, that's it. Let's see that code. For example, well, th again, this is generated with a AR um, dump, uh, dump any, that allows me to be see um, the intermediate representation in a text file format. Uh, you can see here, well, the, the left is hello world, and the right is the intermediate representation. We can see, for example, that imports FNT have a representation in the intermediate representation, main uh, have a function there in the declarations, and the body of the function is there. Um, how, how the intermediate representation is generated? Basically, it's, it's reading all this um, AST and converting declarations from AST to declarations from intermediate representation. In this case, for example, we have the constant declaration that can have an, a list of variables, and for each variable that, well, for a list of constants, and for each constant that it finds, it's going to infer certain things about the type, and it's going to create a new declaration for that constant. Another cool one is the function declaration. Every time we declare a function, it's going to create a node, an intermediate representation node for the function. It's going to check if it's an init function. If it is an init function, it's going to add certain metadata there, and another cool thing is the G later. The G later is going to defer certain part of the processing of this uh, node to later, to a, a, a second phase, a second pass. Uh, that's because we need to have a lot of information of the, um, of the package level declarations to have properly complete all the body functions declarations. So. Uh, as you see here, this G later is for the uh, function body. And finally, it happens uh, everything to the intermediate representation declarations and all that stuff. 
Well, once we have the intermediate representation, we have the passes that we do in the intermediate representation. That passes uh, are, um, well, and mainly four of them, that's dead code elimination is one of the steps in the compiler that start removing code that is not needed because nev it's never called. Uh, another thing is function call inlining. Um, Go have function inlining that supports, um, that what it does is if a function is simple enough, there are some heuristics around that to decide if it's simple enough or not. But if it's simple enough, it's going to inline the calls. So that has certain implications in performance, in, in, in the escape analysis later, and things like that. Another cool thing is the virtualized functions. The virtualizing functions means that if you have an interface, normally if you call a method in an interface, that is going to resolve the method to call in runtime. But if your program only has one possible um, um, concrete type, to execute that interface, is uh, the compiler is going to detect that and is going to replace the interface method call with the uh, concrete type method call. So it's going to save some cycles in uh, the um, in the runtime. And finally, escape analysis for uh, well, escape analysis is a part of the compiler process that takes care of knowing if a var variable or any yeah, a variable needs to go into the heap of the, of the goroutine or needs to go into the stack. Normally, by default, you want that into the heap, but sometimes, sorry, into the stack of the goroutine uh, or into the heap. Uh, that is a shared memory. Normally, you want to have that into the stack. So what it does is detect if you really need to that ha have that into the heap. For example, if you uh, return a pointer for, uh, to a function, sorry, a pointer to a, a variable inside the function, that variable needs to be accessible globally because the current stack frame is not going to exist when you leave the function. So escape analysis detects that kind of cases and decides if a variable needs to go to the heap. Uh, okay. Well, this is a lot of information, <laughs> so let's let's get rested. Let's breathe a bit. Uh, there's a kitten, so yeah, it's <laughs> nice always. <sighs> I'm I'm actually I'm going a bit fast, so I know that it's a dense topic. It's not super. It's not this kind of lightweight thing that you like w after the lunch, but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm actually going a bit fast, so. I'm going to pace myself a bit. Okay, let's keep going, let's keep going. Once you have the intermediate representation and all that passes and you have the escape analysis done, all that things done, you want to build the, single stat uh, the static single assignment. A static single assignment, as you can guess, is another intermediate representation. So, um, but this is a special one. SSA is not something from the Go compiler. It's a more general concept that basically have certain rules that you have to um, you have to um, uh, you have to follow to to be able to use SSA. And that rep that um, representation allow you to apply uh, a lot of well known, generally applicable um, optimizations. The rule, the main rules are uh, each variable uh, ha can so, uh, can only be assigned once, so you can't reassign variables, and each um, variable has to be defined before you use it. Uh, sounds like weird, these things that are variables can only be assigned once, but that what it means basically is if you have a variable and you want to reassign the variable, what you are doing is creating a new variable and adding the new value to that. Um, and as I said, with that representation, you can apply a lot of optimization and we are going to see some of them later. Uh, another interesting thing is uh, SSA, is, we have one SSA per function. And it's based on uh, two concepts, that is blocks and values. Let's see what it means. 
this is our hello world, that's the SSA representation. Each, thing, each uh, of these things here is a block. A block is a set of values. It, the, uh, here is a value, and um, this is a, a block, and it's a set of values, and whenever it finish, it can go to another block, it can exit, it can keep going to the next block, things like that. So that's the idea of a block. A block is something that is going to be executed, and then you can go to other places, you jump to other places. And a value, and a value is, um, has a unique identifier, an operator, a type, and a set of parameters. And if you see at the values and start reading the operations, it start looking like assembly, okay? It's kind of pseudo assembly code, okay? Um, so yeah, uh, this is another another way of seeing a static single assignment. There is a, this one is the one from the uh, from the Go compiler. It's generated using this um, this uh, uh, string there at the bottom. But yeah, this is another way you can use the Golang tools uh, Go SSA. It's going to give you a representation that is kind of more human readable. So it's pretty cool, you see the blocks, you see the function where that blocks are defined, how the blocks jumps to another one, and all that stuff. This is pretty cool to understand a bit more about SSA. Um, and how it's generated. Okay, let's see an example here. For example, you have the, a, in a declaration, you can have these statement lists uh, that are nodes from the intermediate representation. Uh, if I, I have a statement list, I'm going to process that with another function, and each statement is processed uh, with this function that have a lot of uh, switch uh, case cases. And for example, here, if we find a declaration, we are going to check if there is, a, if this declaration of this uh, constant variable or whatever in is a, needs to escape, and if that's the case, it's going to instruct uh, the SSA to generate a new uh, heap allocation and all that stuff. Another case is, for example, if this um, statement is a block statement, it's going to delegate to the statement list. So it's going to call it recursively. Another cool one is the if, if this is an if, um, an if declaration, it's going to check if the condition for the if is uh, always uh, the same, it's constant. And in that case, it's going to just check if it's true or false and um, directly generate the block based on the body or on the else, based on that. Also, well, if not, if it's not constant, it's going to generate a new block uh, that is going, to, well, it's going to be the end block, it's going to be where it's going to finish everything. It's going to check if uh, there is a body. If there is a body, it's going to generate that block for the body. If there is an else, it's going to generate a block for the else. And, is, uh, in, and then if the length of the body is uh, bigger than zero is going to process that and generate the, the SSA inside the body in that block uh, and connect that that to the end, to the block that we created at the beginning, and the same for the else. And finally, we start the end block and all that stuff. Okay, once we have all these SSA representation, that's super cool, we have the SSA passes. The SSA passes is going to, well, this is some examples, but there's a lot of them, okay? The SSA passes is going to transform SSA in other SSA that is equivalent, uh, but is uh, normally have certain optimizations. In this case, for example, we have dead code, that is dead code elimination. We can find uh, blocks that are not going to be executed ever. For example, if you have an if that is constant, probably the else is not going to execute it uh, ever. But well, there's cases where uh, there is dead code in SSA. Another thing about dead code is dead code elimination pass is called multiple times in, in during the compile process. It's, it's called a lot of times because sometimes uh, some optimizations can lead to new dead code. So it's not called once, it's called in multiple places in the, in the process of the SSA passes. Another one is source circuit. Source circuit basically reorders the clause, reorders certain things to try to source circuit uh, conditions. For example, if there is something that can be source circuit 
just getting the um, the um, the first um, condition of an if at the beginning, that is going to be more optimal. So it's going to try to do that. A, C a CSE is common sub-expression. For example, whenever you have A plus B plus C, a, a plus B can be a sub-expression that can be used in other places. So if we use A plus B, it's going to calculate A plus B once and reuse that. It's, that's common sub-expression. It's another optimization that's there. And one of the most interesting one is lower. Lower is it's a transformation that is going to take our SSA, that is this pseudo assembly, that is um, architecture independent, and it's going to convert that into a different pseudo assembly that is architecture dependent. This is the first step in the process that your hardware architecture is uh, it's relevant. So um, the lowering phase takes instruction that pseudo instruction that in maybe in, arch in one architecture is just one instruction and maybe in other there's no a specific instruction that is solving that and you need three instructions things like that. So th that lowering phase happens. You get a lot of uh, you, you get a lot of changes in the in the SSA, and then there's a lot of other passes that happens after the lowering phase. After, after getting uh, our SSA into low-level implementation of the of the architecture. Okay, let's see. Uh, this is the example that we saw before. Uh, Hello World SSA before the passes. Okay, and this is the result after the passes. So also you can see. Okay, now we are going to see something else. And you see, this is a very compact, very uh, we here have like four blocks, and we only have one here because you don't need more than one block in this case. Uh, so it, it is pretty amazing how, how the SSA uh, transformations get you to this point. Uh, machine code generation. Uh, okay, once we have the lower version of the SSA, we're going to generate a machine code uh, architecture specific a binary that we are going to execute. So this is an example of uh, the SSA already optimized, and that's the um, and the assembly of the of the source code. And uh, if you uh, if you take a look, there is a, a clear parallelism between both. They are basically just a kind of literal translation already. Of the of the SSA into something that is more uh, assembly. Uh, okay, some examples of that you can see that is going to check for SSA uh, operations there, and it's going to generate this prox that is basically this uh, assembly, uh, um, in memory representation of the assembly. Uh, another example here is the call static or call tail. If it's call tail, it's going to delegate that into another function. If not, I'm going to delegate that in this function there. And I'm going to generate a proc call. So I'm going to call a function there. Uh, I'm going to, well, I'm going to generate a, a call instruction in assembly. And also, for example, there's cases where you are checking, okay, for this architecture family, I'm going to use um, uh, the destination in a reg or in memory or whatever. So there's a lot of tiny details here and there in the, in the compiler. Uh, okay, now you have your, uh, well, your assembly code, you have everything ready for, for running, but you are not able to run yet because you are not dressed for running yet. So <laughs> that's what the linking is about, is taking all your code and put it together with the runtime. The runtime um, um, the runtime is something, it's, it's just a chunk of code. If you have seen the talk previously about the runtime, uh, you can see that you can even modify that and play with that. But the idea is the runtime is going to take care of certain things for you. It's going to take you take care of all the maps, slices, channels, and go routine. All that code is part of the runtime. It's, a, it's something that is there. 
Uh, all the memory management, the garbage collector, all that stuff, um, or the, even the allocations that are done by the memory, man the garbage collector, or the or the program, is done uh, in the runtime. Uh, the scheduler that decides how to manage the go routines and all that stuff is part of the runtime and the startup process. Normally, it's common to understand that okay, the main function is my entry point, but that's not true. The main function is your go entry point, but before you reach that point, uh, you have to do all the startup of the of the go uh, runtime. You have to uh, start the scheduler, the memory management, the garbage collector, all that, ha all that things have to be uh, started, and then it's going to call your main function. So that's part of the runtime. Well, and once you have your binary, all that stuff, this is an extra ball for uh, getting, we are doing a print uh, hello world, but how that goes to the screen. Okay, how, go right to the screen hello world with 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 a bit of magic so basically in our go runtime don't know anything about the screen our go runtime writes hello world to a file descriptor that's what it's doing that's all it's doing and there's some magician in this case uh, the kernel the operating system that is going to convert that into a hello world in the screen so, uh, Go doesn't have ac direct access to the hardware, at least normally. So, um, the kernel normally executes the binary and is the, the one that is taking care of the access to the hardware. And the way that the Go program communicates with the operating system is called syscalls. In this case, for printing something to the screen, it's going to use the write syscall to write to a file descriptor uh, that is the standard out, that is provided by the operating system too. And, um, and that's how the kernel knows that he, the kernel needs to write something to the screen. And how we can see that? Well, a good way to see that is using S-trace. If you, don't know S trace, S trace basically trace the syscalls to the operating system. And in this case, you can see clearly there that there is a syscall called write with, uh, in the file descriptor one that is a standard output uh, with a string hello world. And that is, ha that is all our Go program knows about writing to the screen, it's writing to a file descriptor. Uh, yeah, yep, that's it. I think well, I'm a bit early, but we have time for questions anyway. I'm not finished yet, I'm going to summarize a bit. So I want to review this process here to refresh everything. We have a file that have a source code that goes to the lecturer that gives me a, a set of tokens that goes through the parser that gives me this abstract syntax tree that is a tree representation of our code, then goes through the type checker to ensure that everything makes sense and then gets uh, converted into an intermediate representation, do the intermediate representation passes, so the, the virtualization of functions, escape analysis, inlining, all that stuff. Then the intermediate representation is converted into SSA. SSA have the passes to optimize that, that SSA and convert our uh, SSA code in a very optimal machine-specific uh, SSA code. Then the, our SSA gets transformed in this um, assembly code, and that assembly code gets linked into the uh, with the um, uh, with the runtime, and then we can execute that finally. And whenever we execute that, it's going to send a syscall to operating system to write to the screen. And uh, yeah, that's that's it, the summary. Another well, I have a couple of things that I want to share. One is um, all the illustration of these talks are made by Juan de la Cruz uh, for this uh, specific talk. Our credit common zero, so it's public domain, so that illustration are mine, but also yours. So you can do whatever you want with that. You can do stickers, t-shirts, whatever. It's, it's yours. So uh, it's, on, it's downloadable in Penpot format. Penpot, uh, format. Penpot is an um, open source alternative to Figma. Uh, so you, if you want to download it, it you can do it. Um, 
Another thing is uh, my company, Mattermost, uh, give me uh, some gifts for you, some uh, stickers and pins of, the, of these nice gophers. So if you want to have them, just come after the talk. Also, if you want to approach me and ask me anything later, uh, you can use the pins and the uh, stickers and, as an excuse. So, <laughs> oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, I want the pin, but by the way, and you, just, you, you get me screwed there. So, um, so yeah, go ahead and, and approach me later if you want the pins or after uh, at the coffee uh, or whatever. Um, okay, some references. The Go compiler is super well documented. It's great. There's a lot of uh, of, of chunks of um, of comments at the beginning of the files. So if you start investigating the Go compiler, there's a lot of good comments in the code. But also there are some readme files that give you a more uh, broad overview. For example, in the compile readme, you have a very good introduction of how the compile command works. Also, the SSA uh, part is well documented in a readme there. There is some information about the pseudo assembly in, in Godot Dev, uh, also about the runtime, if you are interested more into the runtime. Uh, there are a couple of SSA talks. Uh, they are kind of bit out of date, but uh, to understand the concept, to understand the, the ideas behind the Go SSA are great. And another one about the Go assembler. <laughs> Yeah, I know I have a long talk and a long talk, and, and I know it's, it's it's dense, so stay with me for one one more minute, because I want to. I hope now uh, you see the the Go compiler less uh, as a magic and more as data transformation. Um, um, also, I want I I hope that you feel. Uh, less intimidated by the Go compiler source code. It's out there, it's open source, you can read it. So don't, don't be afraid of go out there and, and read it. Uh, but the most important thing for me is um, that I want to encourage you to go there, read it, learn from it, and even modify it. It is going to be hard. It's not going to be something super easy. It's going to be exhausting sometimes, but all that clicks on your mind, all that aha moments, that, my gopher's friend, that's magic. Thank you. Thank you.